All right, hello everyone. Sorry for my absence today. Um, not feeling well. So far, negative COVID tests. I'll take another one pretty soon. Um, but hopefully I'll be well enough to come tomorrow. Um, so today we're talking about the Civil War, the lead up to the American Civil War. Um, regarding everything else uh, for the class, just wait till tomorrow and I'll, um, I'll have more to say. The, the Dropbox is, is open. You should have been able to submit that okay. Um, I'll try to get back to you your emails if you sent them uh, by tomorrow. Um, probably not going to have a lot of energy after this, uh, after this lecture. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start out by showing was just all the ways in which that uh, slavery today contributes to climate change, and it's something we don't usually think of. And you know, on the scale of things, it's not not the only thing, but it's a big part of it. The ability to exploit labor without payment <coughs> is basically, you know, against the law almost everywhere. Um, so it means that people can be also probably working in industries that are not very clean, uh, not well regulated, uh, and so on. And the problem, though, is as we see right now, we're seeing a huge displacement. And in the coming decades, we're going to see enormous migrations of people. And one of the problems here is that many of them will be looking for work um, and the labor market may not be able to provide it. Uh, so it's it's a very, it's a, a situation that could be exploited for, for purposes of slavery uh, quite easily. So again, something to uh, think about the, the merger of environmental issues with uh, human rights. Okay, so there are a number of fantastic resources about the Civil War. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of books. Um, at one point, I used to be a little bit of a Civil War buff, um, but that was a long time ago. Nevertheless, it's still something that I find, a, a topic I find extremely interesting, and these are some of the most recent uh, publications that have come out about uh, the Civil War. A fantastic documentary is Ken Burns' Civil War. It was made in like 1990 and really changed television documentary. And so, and it's just a fantastic picture of the complexity of that conflict. Um, so anyway, I'd highly recommend if you have a few hours to, to watch that if you want to binge on something that's uh, historical and um, maybe a little bit different than what you usually binge on. Okay, moving on. I do want to also point out this quote by Lincoln. I mean, one of the things that you realize looking up to the lead up of the Civil War, you know, it wasn't like, you know, all of a sudden there was just conflict. It was slow boiling conflicts and so on and so forth uh, between politicians, farmers, family. Um, we're seeing similar things now, but, but around very different issues. Nevertheless, I think this quote by Lincoln still holds true today for the decisions that we make. Uh, the fiery trials through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest uh, generation. I think that speaks well of us too. We should think about our own actions uh, in that sort of way. What we do will you know, shine on down uh, past our own lifetime. Now, again, uh, what does the Civil War have to do with racism today, aside from obviously setting the structural conditions of uh, inequality and so on? But even more than that, uh, there's a paper that came out a few years ago by some researchers where they basically found that some of the most racist places in the United States, at least against black people, were counties that all the way back in 1860 had the higher, higher proportions of slavery, higher proportions of uh, enslaved black people. So again, as, as I say, as the percentage of the population in a county accounted for, uh, accounted for by the enslaved increases, there is a decreased likelihood that the contemporary white residents or the white residents, uh, residents of today will identify as a Democrat, uh, support affirmative action, and perhaps you know, most directly, you know, the, the clearest link is uh, that they tend to score high on measures of of, of prejudice, uh, negative beliefs uh, about black people. So the white, the white population in those counties that had the highest proportion of enslaved residents way back in 1860 have the most uh, racist beliefs today. 
and they have this handy little map showing uh, where this this is showing 1860 uh, the you know where the highest percentage of um, of slaves were so you see along the Mississippi River Delta 81%, not 100%, obviously, but 81% to very high percentages uh, were, were, were slaves. And so what they did is they, you know, looked at race-related beliefs in all these different counties and found that the highest uh, levels of racism were here in the Mississippi Delta, uh, parts of this belt through the Carolinas and Georgia and Mississippi and so on, part of Texas. Very interesting. I, you know, it's just, it's kind of, sad tragic result after 100 and um you know 60 years or whatever things have not changed much from the perspective of social science it's a very interesting and i think a very consequential uh, research finding so they also tried to figure out like oh okay why <laughs> why you know why is there so much racism in these places and they looked at all the standard uh, sociological variables you know the urban rural differences crime you know family types nuclear family single mothers drug use all these different things that us sociologists are used to looking at and so for controlling all of these things, the number one uh, predictor was parents teaching their children. So basically you have racism going down the generations, parents teaching their children these, these, these beliefs, uh, white children, these beliefs. So again, um, interesting finding. It also shows, hopefully, that Maybe if we can change the attitudes of, of the Southern whites, you know, maybe that can uh, change, change the attitude of the next generation. Although at the moment we seem to be going in a, you know, unfortunately in a different direction, but anyway. Okay, so when we talk about slavery, um, it's, it's a human story, but it's also an environmental story. And so these are two fantastic books I would recommend if you're interested in this. Uh, I should say today's lecture is going to be uh, very image-based, not as much text as usual, perhaps. I might be going a little bit quicker just for my throat. Um, so anyway, The Nature of Slavery, Environment, and Plantation Labor in the Anglo-Atlantic World. Again, there, there are things from this history that really, that, you know, live on through, uh, to, through to today. At the end of the Civil War, one of the things that we see happen is what's called the Great Migration. I should say this comes in the late 1800s, early 1900s. For a couple of reasons, we'll get into some of it and we'll talk about more next lecture. But basically, you still had a lot of, um, you still had a lot of uh, segregation. Oh, I'm sorry, this map is actually... Um, way back when there was slavery. I'm sorry, this is a pre-Civil War map. <laughs> okay, uh, shall I edit this part out? Anyway, this, but you see something similar that we'll talk about tomorrow, which is the Great Migration. But before the Great Migration outward, you still had a lot of people, you know, leaving the South, heading North, escaping slavery, uh, and you can see where the free states were and where uh, the slave states were. Again, the Civil War itself, there's, you know, the chapter talks about the environmental issues. There are books on this. Again, very, very interesting. Um, they tell you not just, obviously, the history of the Civil War and the environment, but also just war. Um, the, the role that the environment plays in any war, from uh, food and rations to, uh, you know, the, the destruction of the environment by shelling and, uh, you know, guns and bombs and so on, um, to all the, you know, all the fields, crops, and so on that are picked by soldiers, all, all of these sorts of things uh, really play, play a huge role in what happens to, to the land uh, during this time. Again, books specifically about this, War Upon the Land, Military Strategy, and the Transformation of Southern Landscapes during the American Civil War. You know, one of the things that the North did was to, they you know, destroyed the field, destroyed the fields in the South. Most of the war was fought in the South, um, and they knew that, well, you know, if, if you destroy enough farmland, then the South is going to struggle uh, to feed it, to feed their troops, and, you know, wars don't last much longer uh, if troop, if armies can't be fed. 
<laughs> so one of the top uh, scholars on this, Andrew Smith, here, I think there's a presentation by him, yes, did hunger defeat the Confederacy? And here's his books called Starving the South, How the North Won the Civil War, so basically <laughs> uh, answering his, his question there. Uh, but th these pictures are depicting these riots. Uh, you see the, some of these famous bread riots that happened, uh, oftentimes mostly women and children, uh, in some cases slaves, slave children as well, uh, you know, smashing into stores and, uh, you know, granaries meant for the, the Confederate soldiers, you know, because they needed to eat. Um, and so you saw a lot of food riots, especially uh, in the years towards the end of the war. Now, slavery itself is a long, a, an important part of American history, despite how much there are a lot of people who want to ignore this part of American history, which is insane because it's it's a, an enormous, enormous portion of American history and uh, American economics, American food politics. You can't talk about any of this without talking about slavery. But a lot, what, what a lot of people don't know is that actually it was actually a very small percentage of slaveries that were taken directly to North America. As you can see, the vast majority, well, a huge number of them, most of them uh, ended up going to Brazil. Um, and that's and if you go to South America along the Atlantic in some of these countries, um, it, you see villages that look more like an African village in, in Liberia um, rather than what you would see in traditionally in South America. So again, it's the, the story of slavery is not just about the United States, but goes down uh, through across all the Americas. Um, the Caribbean, you know, why is Haiti all black people, basically? Uh, because it was a former slave state. It was also a slave state that staged a successful revolution. Um, a, a couple of months ago, the New York Times had a huge groundbreaking story where they they had this huge history of how France and Wall Street basically conspired for decades going into the 20th century on how to keep Haiti down and how to exploit it. Um, really fascinating investigative journalism. Uh, highly recommend you, you, you look into it if you're interested in you know, why is Haiti the way it is, because of Wall Street and France primarily. Okay, so you also had a huge percentage that died um, on uh, en route. So in terms of 1879, when the Constitution is signed, this is essentially what America looked like then. Virginia was awfully big. North Carolina, these places were much bigger than uh, they are today. Um, the, the orange ones are slave states. New York at that time was a slave state, so was New Jersey. Um, the Great Lakes states, or what became them, were free territories. Um, you also had free states such as Pennsylvania and other places. So this is what it looked like uh, when, when the when the society when the country was formed. 1861, the year that the Civil War broke out. There you see uh, the South. You have basically the same states as we have today. Um, and they're all slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, and I believe Maryland ended up not uh, seceding and basically stayed part of the Union. Slavery was abolished there. Uh, you know, California and, and Oregon come into the picture as well. Uh, Kansas, I grew up about right there in Nebraska. I went to Lawrence, Kansas, to the University of Kansas there. Um, there's a brewery there called Free Street. Uh, Free State Brewery because it was a free state and there, if you know the history there was, you know, kind of like the mini Civil War before the big Civil War happened in Kansas about whether or not it should become uh, a slave state and the, the free state uh, folks ended up winning. Interesting history there. Oh, this I meant to show on the right after the slide about slavery, but one of the, you know, one of, I think, one of the most interesting sort of um, imaginative arts work that's kind of come out of slavery um, is this, the Book of Drexia. Um, and it's, it's sort of out as a musical project by a couple of guys in Detroit. And it's part of what we call Afrofuturism. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's kind of combining, um, you know, the black experience in the United States, you know, myths and whatever and whatnot in Africa itself, 
um, and kind of you know turning them into a sort of a sci-fi fantasy thing. So the Book of Drexia is pretty interesting. This is the graphic novel, but uh, the basic theme is that uh, these pregnant women on these slave ships are thrown overboard, um, and rather than drowning, they actually, you know, don't die, I forget how that happens, but um, or don't want to ruin it. Um, and anyway, the society forms under the water of these, you know, people that had been taken from Africa and were thrown overboard. Very fascinating, very imaginative, I think. Um, again, if you're sort of interested in this and kind of stuff along these lines, I highly recommend uh, you know, checking out Afrofuturism. Now, going back to the topic of today, so American slavery, I should say American capitalism has slavery at its roots. Uh, it'd be very difficult to kind of, well, understand America without, uh, without understanding these things. So this is the classic work uh, from 1944 that was written on this. <coughs> You also have a more recent work that's, that, that's um, studied this as well. So first, you don't start out with uh, that many slaves in the United States, but there's this realization that there's this land here, we can grow crops, we can sell it back in Europe and so on. Uh, so you had them, you know, white men primarily, growing tobacco, because tobacco was all the rage in Europe, everybody's getting addicted, uh, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so you can kind of read the text there, I'm not going to speak about it at all. Um, but, you know, they don't, they're, they're not using slaves, they're using indentured servants who basically have a contract to do a job, um, and, you know, they're, when their job is done, then they're free and that kind of thing. However, market economics come in, and as you're getting to the end of the 1600s, you know, servants are asking for more money, um, and the price of tobacco begins to fall because everybody's, you know, everybody's uh, growing it and, and flooding the market and so on. In the upper part of the South, <clears throat> from you have, you know, tobacco being grown. Um, in the, the Bahamas, you have sugar canes and sugar fields and so on some parts of the United States as well. Then in the, 17, uh, the 1720s, uh, South Carolina starts to experiment uh, with rice production, and they start to realize it grows very well in these marshes. Also at this time, uh, Andrew Jackson is you know, kind of speaking up for the Southern planters and so on, and for that he's labeled a populist. Um, but one of the other things that he does, and he also he speaks up for the farmers, and some of them are poor and whatnot, against the kind of industrial, emerging industrial uh, elites of the North. The other thing that he does that he's probably most famous for is this mass deportation of uh, Native Americans and indigenous groups to what's now Oklahoma, and moving them basically all out of the South, and that then frees up uh, a lot of uh, a lot of land for for cultivation by slave-owning uh, plant plantation owners. I put myself... Okay. <clears throat> so they call West Africa sometimes the rice coast because a lot of rice was, was grown there. Um, women basically you know, kind of started the rice farming in, uh, in, in the Americas. Um, it was very hard work, as you can see there. They would you know, be working in the water. Um, they worked under what's called a task system, so they received a certain amount of work, uh, a task, and once they finished that, they could do as they please. I, like, I should have worded that a little bit different, not do exactly what they please, but they had uh, considerable freedom with what they wanted to do, what they could do uh, the rest of the day. They couldn't become free people, though, actually free people, and you know, decide to change jobs um, or live somewhere else or something like that. Um, we talked about Asia and all the cooperation that, it, that um, rice, uh, rice farming requires. Again, it required the same amount of cooperation here in the States, uh, the difference being that the people working were slaves, and so they were forced uh, to cooperate. 
uh, just a picture from the 18, from 1867, uh, showing kind of what uh, the rice farming, uh, rice farming system kind of looked like. So a couple of things happened. They started to realize that along the coast, you could use tidal energy as sort of uh, that would come up through the the water. I mean, come up through these canals, um, and it'd be brackish, but it would you know it would um, it would dramatically reduce at least initially the amount of physical labor that was uh, that was needed. Of course, the planters, the slave owners, soon realized this that they can you know double double their money essentially, um, and they started uh, you know requiring the slaves uh, to to work to work longer hours and work more than. Um, other problems, the tidewater areas bred mosquitoes, uh, so you had malaria. Interestingly, it was, you know, a, a lot of the slaves from Africa were actually immune to a few, uh, a few kinds of malaria, so it didn't strike them as hard as it hit uh, a lot of the, the white European Americans. But not, you know, not badly, not, it was not like smallpox or hitting the Native Americans or something like that. Now, just out of curiosity, uh, rice growing in the United States, yeah, not much of that going on. You see some of it in the Mississippi, along the Mississippi and uh, Arkansas, a little bit in Missouri and Texas and so on. Then you've got some here up in Northern California, interestingly enough. Um, big report came out recently about how this whole area is subject to potential flooding eventually. So. Anyway, uh, again, not much rice growing now. Most of that, again, has now moved uh, to, to Asia. Now, of course, cotton is, you know, the one, uh, the crop that a lot of people were most familiar with when we think of slavery uh, in the United States. We tend to think of, we tend to think of cotton. Now, interestingly, um, cotton actually becomes even becomes a bigger crop after uh, the Civil War, after the emancipation of slavery. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Now, uh, the history of cotton, the other major cotton, the other major source of cotton uh, around this time is in India. Um, the East India Company, which was a British company that essentially you know, kind of ruled India for almost a, a century, you know, they one of the things that they wanted to do was to destroy the local Indian um, Indian cotton industry, um, so they could replace it with you know, what they wanted to have grown. Tea, that's where the British obsession with uh, tea comes from, and they wanted to sort of, you know kind of expropriate the cotton industry there, make it on their own, um, because they they're starting to realize like okay this. There's something going on in the Americas, a civil war. We don't know how, how stable uh, that, that production is going to be. Now, today, if you look at the cotton industry, it's still pretty bad. Um, there's still a lot of slavery that happens in the cotton industry. Uh, you know, the difference is that's not happening in, happening in America. It's ha happening in other places. Uh, this is the name of a, a book. This is a sort of documentary that was made on, off of it um, that you can watch on YouTube if you're interested places where we see it today, uh, Uzbekistan. So you can see where the parts of Uzbekistan that have a lot of uh, cotton slavery or cotton production going on. Um, you have, you know, you can just find image after image of kids and other slaves working uh, in, in the fields of Uzbekistan. Now, my understanding is that they've cracked down on it, that, you know, it's, it's being phased out. But again, that's, I might, you know, I might not be up to date on this. Now again, here is sort of the story of, of cotton in Uzbekistan. You can see that it, uh, it begins to fall. Uh, Uzbekistan cotton exports begin to fall as we, as, we move, uh, as we move forward. A number of major Western and other companies, you know, basically said we're not going to use uh, labor from Uzbekistan if, if, if it's slave labor. But remember, it's not out of their, you know, uh, you know, the goodness of their heart. It's usually a campaign by consumers and others that uh, forces companies to do stuff like this. Um, the other place where we're where we're seeing a lot of uh, cotton slavery is in Xinjiang, uh, in western China. 
um, and there are a number of companies that are under pressure there uh, to 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 cut ties, basically, um, because we know that the Uyghur population there is being oppressed in a lot of different ways, and one of these is uh, through cotton slavery. You can see where it's produced. You know, the vast majority of um, of cotton being produced in China is coming out of Xinjiang, and that's where we see all the, you know, the camps and uh, and stuff like that. Here's the, you know, the kind of the basics of the industry. Xinjiang, 87% of China's uh, total production, 67% uh, of China's consumption. So huge, huge uh, amounts of cotton being picked there. Again, research, investigative research has shown that a lot of it is slave, uh, slave labor. Um, China, it's not that, you know, Americans can, you know, boycott all they want, but that doesn't necessarily, that won't necessarily have a big impact because you have Cambodia, Philippines, all these other countries that actually uh, depend on, on China for cotton. And they've gotten used to cheap cotton, you know, slavery produces cheap cotton. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you look at the economics of capitalism, at a certain point, slavery actually undermines uh, the system because the question is, okay, slaves can't, you know, spend money, so where's the demand going to come from? Okay, going back to America, 1800s, um, Eli Whitney, who, <laughs> for whatever reason, everybody knows this advent inventor uh, from high school. If, no, you know, if they don't know anybody else, they, they know Eli Whitney. Uh, he made this cotton engine, which more popular in popularly known as the cotton gin. It separates cotton fibers from the seeds. Huge innovation, huge time saver, that kind of thing. There's a different, there's different varieties of cotton that they're experimenting with at this time. Uh, long staple cotton. Short staple cotton is shown to be the most ex successfully grown, uh, at least in the South. Cotton becomes this crop they start to realize is um, easy to produce because, you know, you can have cotton, you don't need to have them close to ra railroads, you know, the cotton isn't going to go bad or something like that, uh, as opposed to food, uh, food stuff. So by the 1850s, the North is starting to become re pretty reliant upon uh, southern cotton, and cotton is the major export from the United States. Around this time, you also have the discovery of what's called Mexican cotton, which has <coughs> larger cotton bowls, meaning it's easier to pick. Um, and some people say that this is actually, as, you know, as helpful to the cotton industry as the cotton gin was. I mean, just you know, this type of cotton, um, it just you know, revolutionized production. Some slide again. Downloaded. Uh, so king cotton, cotton replaces uh, sugar as the major source of um, crops using slave labor. Um, Thirty-three fourths of the world's supply at this time are coming from the south. Um, you know, Manchester, England, where you have the Industrial Revolution taking off, they're getting cotton primarily from the south, uh, and, and so. So the southern economy at this time had, was making more money than the north. The difference is, though, that uh, it's being held by this sort of feudal landowning class, landowning, slave owning uh, class. You know, the the poor cotton, the poor white farmers that don't don't own slaves. They're not releasing much of this wealth. Obviously, the slaves aren't. In the north, there's not as much concentrated wealth, but you do have more industry and you do have more wage labor. Um, so workers are making more money than their counterparts uh, in the South. So what we find is that you have where you had more slave, uh, slave populations, you had worse soil erosion um, because they would just work them, work them to death and work the land to death, um, you know, not really recognizing the incentive or, you know, for treating the land well, essentially. They were all just about that money. Um, they went into monoculture, and as we all know, monocultures after a time can be pretty bad for, uh, for different soils. So this is a couple of maps showing cotton production as well as slavery. And as you see here, 
Uh, this is 1820, the major production area, really just part of South Carolina, a few places, you know, in, uh, across the South. Then you get to 1860, 40 years later. Um, there you've got a lot of uh, major production and it's basically being planted across the South. Remember here, um, these are the places where you have the most cotton being produced, where you have the highest slave density, um, and 160 years later, or whatever, you also have uh, more, you know, more uh, the, the strongest uh, held racist attitudes. Um, again, kind of showing the slave, uh, the slave um, map, 1790. You have under 10% in a lot of places, except along the, along the coastlines where they're starting to grow rice and stuff. 1860 then, you've got slaves um, across, across the south. Really looking, again, this is essentially the same map as the one I showed earlier. So you can think, okay, these places that have um, high, you know, high percentage of, uh, of slavery, those also have the most uh, racist attitudes in 2022. 20, uh, now again, it's easy to just kind of like wag our fingers at, at the at the South, but you know the North benefited economically from slavery, and they were quite complicit in it. Um, a lot of people didn't want to end slavery, were, were cared more about preserving the Union rather than ending slavery, um, and all of these things. <coughs> and just like today, we can't feel too you know, high and mighty when we're using laptops and phones that basically require uh, slave labor from uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But over time, the abolitionists become louder and, you know, the war itself, the, the conflict itself makes people think about, okay, what do we want to be as a nation? Um, and more and more people start to be swayed by the abolitionists. This doesn't mean that they believe in equality. This doesn't mean they believe uh, black people and white people should be equal. But they were turning against the idea that people can't own other people. That becomes a very popular attitude uh, in the North. Now, today we, um, you know, we're getting used to political violence once again. Um, and if you look at the history of America up to the Civil War, one of the things we find um, is that there was a lot of violence. Um, there were a lot of fights breaking out uh, over slavery um, in bar rooms and stuff like that, but also in legislatures, state legislatures, um, as well as the, the, the National Congress. This is a famous fight that broke out. Um, I think his name is George Sumner. Sumner, I know, is his his uh, his name, and you can see they're fighting about Kansas. Uh, you know, Kansas, are they going to be a free state? Or are they going to be a slave state? Uh, this, I forget his name, a southern legislator from, I believe, Alabama. Uh, you know, he, he had a walking cane, and he attacked uh, Sumner with it and, you know, beat him a couple of times or whatever. And, you know, it sounds like something that you would see today. Um, Jubilant Southerners start mailing them uh, new cane, mailing that guy new canes and stuff like that. So again, there's a there's a lot of violence that's happening uh, in the build up to the actual actual big war. So pretty pretty soon, well, you have the original Mason Dixon line here, and then it was kind of used to demarcate uh, slave states and free uh, and free states. Now, you had in the South after Abraham Lincoln, after the election of Abraham Lincoln, that is the spark that, uh, that lights uh, the South's movement toward secession. So you can see the vast majority of Southern counties or districts voted for secession. You know, a few places didn't. A lot of West Virginia didn't, and that's why West Virginia becomes uh, West Virginia. Then you had a number of places that, that voted against it as well. Pretty soon, though, um, you know, once the secession happens, a lot of people just kind of fall, fall in line. 
for those of you interested budding political scientists you can look at the uh, breakdown of the of the 1860 election Lincoln the, the votes for Lincoln are in red and orange and pink and that sort of color uh, dark green for Breckenridge who was kind of a pro-slavery uh, figure uh, Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in like 10 southern states or something I mean really kind of shocking um, so obviously he wasn't going to win there when they refused uh, to even put him out on the ballot. Um, excellent book, came, I mean book, movie uh, that came out a number of years ago called Lincoln, about Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. It's very good history, I think. Uh, here's his original, um, original campaign poster, free speech, free homes, free territory, protection to American industry. Notice it doesn't say anything about freeing the slaves. You know, Lincoln wanted to do that in his diaries. He talks about it. He just, he's worried, though, that, um, and I think rightfully so, that most of the nation just isn't yet there. They're not behind him yet. And so he has to kind of subtly make the case, essentially. So the Civil War breaks out. Here we've got the Red Slaves, the, the Confederacy, the, the Union. There's 22 million people in the, in the Union, over 100,000 factories, as opposed to the South, where there's only 9 million people, almost half of which, if not more, are actually slaves. Different estimates about this. I think about a third to a half is, uh, is about accurate. Then about 18,000 factories, and these are not you know, major factories either. So the South poor agrarian societies with a feudal slave-owning class, um, and then uh, the northern states that are industrial and, 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 and agricultural, but you know, no slaves. Looking at the resources, the gray is the Union, the black is the Confederacy. Just on everything, you basically, the North, the Union has more, whether it's merchant ships, number of farms, uh, banking capital, uh, miles of railroad track. Etc. Etc. The 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 uh, the union has the 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 advantage when it comes to resources. Here are train lines. As you can see, once again, um, the north has lots of trains, not so many in the south. This means that the north can move people, armies, and goods around very quickly, um, much more efficiently. And. The while the war is going on, you still have the United States that are that are talking about expansion. Uh, they're saying, you know, go out to Iowa, Nebraska. There's millions of acres, and you can have your own. And they brought in the that rectangular Jeffersonian idea um, to you know split up land for homesteaders, and they're basically you know making sure that you know Nebraska and Kansas are free um, and Iowa and so on because they want to make it, they're basically saying you can this is you know open land you can be your own rugged individual and freedom and and all of that and um so again you know the south doesn't have anything to offer you know poor southerners like this um so again this is just another incentive like oh, oh, okay there might be other opportunities when when this war is over Again, as you see, the vast majority of, of the battles that were fought were in the South. Uh, you know, the North has the bigger armies to invade. The South tries to invade a couple of times. They get badly defeated uh, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, when, you know, I still think it's the most bloody battle in American history in terms of lives lost. Um, if you ever go there, I've been there once, and it, it's really kind of an... Um, a powerful experience, kind of like going to any of these Civil War battlefields and, you know, going to a plantation and seeing the old slave quarters. It's all very, at least I find it to be, you know, very powerful and moving and, uh, and so on. And then, you know, reading um, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and reading the soldiers who talk about him when he comes after, um, when the battle's over, and there's still, you know, bodies everywhere and just misery, uh, misery abounds. And he gives this uh, powerful speech. So you might want to ask, okay, why did these poor Southerners, not the, you know, not the slave owners, why did these poor Southerners who really, you know, hadn't been treated well in the South, they didn't own much, um, they weren't really benefiting from the slavery, uh, system of slavery, 
why did they fight? Why did they fight to defend uh, this basically this plantation aristocracy? Well, if you remember from class, uh, I believe it was last week, um, goes back to that culture of honor. You know, <clears throat> if you read diaries or if you watch the Civil War documentary by Ken Burns, they're not saying, "Oh, we want to defend slavery because that's part of our way of life" or something like this. No, they are defending their land, their homeland from these invaders. Um, you know, they've been insulted by these north by the Northern Union, uh, and this attack by Union forces is about as insulting as you can get. And so, the culture of honor that they bring from you know the Highlands of Scotland, you know, it <laughs> it shows forth uh, in uh, in this in this conflict. Sorry, my. I don't know if you can tell, but my throat hurts. <laughs> okay, anyway, moving on. So the Union after, well, before Gettysburg, but especially afterward, their whole strategy, their, you know, what they're trying to do is invade the South, and uh, particularly they start to fight a lot of battles along the Mississippi, and eventually essentially cut the Confederacy in two. Um, the, the Confederacy relies upon uh, the relies upon the Mississippi to you know float goods from one part of the area to the to the next because they don't have a lot of uh, train lines. But uh, the Union takes New Orleans pretty quickly. They take over much of the river except Vicksburg. Vicksburg is this town, I believe, in Mississippi um, that becomes one of the biggest siege battles in world history. Uh, it kind of is a precursor to what we see uh, in the First World War. Um, and they hold off the Union for a long, long, long time. Um, and really, it's not the Union attacks and soldiers and, and, and cannons that, that, that force the uh, Confederacy out. It's the, the lack of food. Eventually, the supplies run out as we often see in sieges. So this was basically the, the, very, the initial strategy, uh, it was sometimes called the Great Snake. Uh, they have this huge blockade of ships to prevent uh, cotton from going out to Europe or other goods from coming in, say weaponry or other things the South might need. And that in, in many ways is, is a very important strategy. <coughs> to defeat the South. The blockade works quite well. Earlier than Gettysburg, back in, I believe, 1862, yes, December 13th, 1862, you have the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, again, I went on a vacation one time, and like I said, I was a Civil War buff, and I went to a lot of these different battles. I was quite young. My, my parents took me to these different battles, I should say. Um, and it's just incredible because you had tens of thousands of people dying at these places and you go to these towns today and they're just quiet, quaint little towns and it's just, you know, I sit there try to imagine what it looked like um, on December 13th, 1862. So here, this is a very consequential battle in many ways. Again, it's kind of Pre is a precursor to the siege war of siege warfare of the First World War. Uh, Lee's forces dig in on this high ground, even in battles, the environment play is one of the most consequential factors. You know, if you have the high ground, that's <laughs> it's easier to shoot down at someone than shoot someone up above. Uh, Burnside, this guy who's the general of the Union forces, he just has wave of wave of soldiers attack and they you know get mowed down um, and you know they but they do enough damage to severely um, to severely injure Lee's army and also this becomes stylish Burnsides was his name we now know them more <laughs> better as Burnsides switch that around uh, but that's where that's where that comes from. At a certain point, Burnside, uh, Burnside tries to win the advantage by uh, crossing this Rappahannock River and um, kind of going through the south. But unlike today, you know, they didn't have the best meteorologists, and a lot of a lot of them had never been to the south really or knew what it was like when it rained uh, in the south. But in Virginia and actually a lot of the south. 
when it rains, it does pour, and when it pours, it turns places into mud. Um, and so the the Union soldiers were were not re were not ready for this. They just weren't prepared. Um, they would get their horses stuck, their wagons stuck. It just turned into this a huge muddy disaster, uh, as you can see here. It's called the Mud March, and they're just doing this march. They're getting all wet, and uh, it just sounds awful. And as we know, you know, wetness breeds disease and all this stuff. So. You know, that did more to harm the Union Army at this point than, uh, than most of the battles had. Um, again, like I said, you also had Confederates who, even though they might be more used to, to the, the weather and stuff, they still suffered the same problems, you know. Just because they're from the South doesn't mean their, wheel, their wagons are going to make it through the mud any easier. Um, and <clears throat> unlike the Union, they actually they had less supplies. So, you know, if something, you know, got wet and ruined, it was, it was a much bigger problem for them than, uh, than the North. Eventually, what a lot of uh, them had to do were to try to build these roads then to get across this mud because they couldn't just wait there for it to dry. Um, and so they would chop down trees and lay those down. And obviously this isn't from the Civil War because it's in color. Um, but this is basically what it looks like. You chop a bunch of trees down. They call them corduroy roads because if you're familiar with the corduroy fabric, these kind of has these little bumps on it. I, I don't know how to describe it best. Um, you can see it here. This Jeep is about to drive through. The Jeep could probably make it through the mud, but maybe not. So they built a, one of those corduroy roads there. So when it would, so after a while, then this is what the armies were doing. The environmental impact of this, of course, is that it requires a lot of uh, deforestation. Now, in terms of food, uh, a few things, another few things that were advantageous for the Union. Um, right before the Civil War, condensed milk had been patented, um, and it was patented in the North by a Northerner, Gail Borden, and he was in favor of the, favor of the Union, so you know, they got a lot of condensed milk, and that proved to be very useful, very, you know, very healthy, well, very healthy for them. Um, otherwise, both North and South were eating a lot of heart attack, which <coughs> forget what it's made out of. I, I had it once and it's very bland and it's very hard. Um, you know, I can only imagine the damage it did to people's teeth back then. Sort of the supplies that you would see, you know, vinegar, spice, flour, all, all, all barrels and barrels and barrels of stuff. I did want to kind of, you know, kind of You know, kind of just talk about today. Um, you can read this about when Stalin, back in the 1930s, you know, attempted to, he wanted to destroy Ukraine, essentially. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, but they still had too many independent ideas uh, for Stalin then and Putin now. Um, and so he essentially tried to destroy the society by. Um, taking all of the food that the peasants made, um, forcing them onto these collective farms where, you know, the food would be made for the Soviet Union. Uh, and it led to this, you know, massive starvation there. Fantastic book, Red Famine, about this. Um, I talked about it a little bit before. So I just, again, wanted to sort of mention, you know, how important the land is, um, not just here, but in the conflicts that we see happening today and sort of the history of those conflicts and how they relate uh, to the environment. So just a few days ago, I just saw this headline, and this is very important. This is what we see, you know, in, in the Civil War as well. Uh, if a army could be cut off from their supply lines, that army was in trouble. Ukraine says it can hit almost all uh, of Russian supply lines in the occupied South. So that, again, is that does not bode well for the Russian forces there, if true. Uh, you know, there's a lot of propaganda coming from both sides. Early in the war, uh, it's, these three pictures were taken, these abandoned supply, supply trucks for the Russian army, 
And it was quite stunning what they found there. Uh, there was not a lot of food for the Russian soldiers. They had potatoes um, and onions and you have some pickles. And that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the soldiers, the Ukrainian soldiers were really stunned and the journalists were stunned that when they came across this stuff. That's not much different than this picture here where what the, the czarist um, Russian soldiers were being supplied with in the First World War. You know, and they were complaining about that. Uh, Russian soldiers, 2022, they're still getting, uh, you know, frozen potatoes. And the weather there, you know, when a lot of these uh, supply trucks were opened, you know, the potatoes and onions were frozen, you know, so that explains why so many Russian soldiers were ransacking homes for whatever food they could find. Really shocking for that to be happening to a 21st century army that is literally, the, the home of the army is right next door. You think it would be easier to get supplies across. Anyway, really mind-boggling, horrible military stress. Uh, as I said, I kind of mentioned Gettysburg already, but this is kind of a major turning point. Um, happens in Pennsylvania. One of the reasons, a couple reasons, that uh, the, the, the Southern Army comes this way is they want to draw the Northern Army into a defeat on their own soil. They go to Gettysburg because they hear a couple of things. One is that is supposedly there's um, a, a warehouse full of shoes at Gettysburg and the southerners don't really have shoes or they're not very good. Um, there's supposed to be another food depot or something as well. So again, it's kind of these basic supply issues that lead them uh, to Gettysburg where they're, they are eventually defeated uh, quite in a, quite a bloody battle. After that, uh, Ulysses S. Grant takes control of the Northern Army and he is determined to just smash the Confederacy. And so what happens, you essentially have you know, a few battles, but the major battle is Petersburg. Again, this is like a precursor to the First World War, a siege warfare. Um, I went there as well, and you have these hills all over the place now. And what's interesting are these, that these hills that have grass growing on them, these are the former trenches and barriers that were built in the 1860s uh, uh, during the war. Eventually, the Southern Army is basically defeated. They have no more supplies. They're running out of food, ammo, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is, again, as I said, this is Petersburg, and you can see it. It looks like it, looks like it could be from the First World War in, in Belgium or something. In the south, you have another attack, and, you know, the attack is on the land, Sherman's famous march, where he goes from Georgia to, I mean, goes from uh, South Carolina. Where does he go? I have a map going. He marches across the south um, and along the way is just destroying everything. Uh, destroying factories, destroying plantation houses, uh, ripping up train yards, and freeing, sle uh, look, freeing slaves. A lot of slaves are, are, are made free, as you can see uh, in this painting here. And he's still hated in the south to this day by uh, people that still, you know, side with the Confederacy. So Sherman's march, um, you know, the, the major part of it is uh, in, in Georgia, and you can look at the details there if you're, if you're interted. But um, a 50, 50 mile wide swath, I mean 50 miles uh, wide, going all the way across Georgia, just destroying everything. Um, again, another major reason for the, the fall of the Confederacy. And after he's done there, he's like, well, Let's go north. And they go up through South Carolina uh, and then up to North Carolina. And they're essentially getting ready to go up to Virginia to either uh, take the capital in Richmond or join Grant uh, in the siege of Petersburg. Other thing that happens that's very important is uh, a number of freed slaves join uh, join the Union Army. There's a great movie about this called Glory um, with uh, Matthew Broderick, Denzel Washington, uh, Morgan Freeman, others. Fantastic movie, uh, a very powerful film. There's a myth about black soldiers in the Confederacy, but I don't think there's been any actual <laughs> evidence of that, of that being, as it were, actually been found. 
So in the aftermath of slavery, we'll go into this in more detail tomorrow, but essentially their suffering does not end. They become free. Not all of them know that they're free. Some of them are enslaved for a bit longer until you know Juneteenth um, in Texas. <clears throat> So anyway, um, a lot of a lot of the former slaves then become sharecroppers um, to work for southern landowners, and they're they're essentially free, but they, they you know, but they're still you know the most exploited workers in in America at this time. A fantastic book about this is W. E. B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. Um, he was is born just a few years after the the end of the war, um, and it becomes he becomes the first black person to get a PhD at Harvard. Um, he becomes one of the first major black sociologists, and he's really the first. American sociologists to talk about race, um, which is a huge topic in sociology now. And I think, like what he says here, one is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, uh, distorted, or skimmed over. That's what we're seeing today. Like this, this attempt not to teach about slavery, about civil rights, you know, not to teach about American history. Um, he would he would not be surprised by what by what's going on. Uh, today. Now, um, where do I put myself over here? <laughs> okay, so my last slide here, I just want to kind of point out um, that early after uh, slavery, you did have a number of, or quite a few, um, black, black men who are elected as legislators. That kind of falls during the during the Jim Crow era, um, you start to see that, you know, there are all these ways in which uh, states have literacy tests, poll taxes, all these ways that black people are kept from voting uh, to the point that, you know, no one's elected. And that's a direct consequence of these policies. Uh, when that comes to an end and you get civil rights and so on, then you start to see um, uh, a huge rise in black representatives that continues on to today. All right, well, we will continue tomorrow. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the end, or I'm sorry, the um, post-Civil War, the Reconstruction, um, and, you know, start getting into um, the westward uh, migration. All right, everyone, I hope you have a good day.